Ask a room full of, of Jesus followers if we could count on each other to pitch in and get a hand and serve somewhere. And uh, probably a whole lot of hands would go up. There'd be all kinds of offers for help, right? I mean, last Sunday was an example of that. We said, hey, can you help out and serve? And people immediately responded. Ask the same room full of people, hey, can you help out? We have, uh, we're going to go and we're going to share our faith with people. Then all of a sudden, the floor becomes a really uh, great point of interest for people. Right? I look down. Because there's something about that, right? That, that for whatever reason, there are different reasons. It, it might be, I, I'm just not sure how I would handle it. I feel inadequately prepared, inadequately trained. I don't have the gift of evangelism. Uh, not a good excuse, by the way. But to those who do, they just thrive at it more, right? Just as those who have the gift of service thrive at, share, at serving more than uh, the ordinary person. A lot of us would just duck for cover um, and, and maybe, maybe uh, try to get out of the room discreetly. In fact, in my first year of Bible college, I signed up for, uh, for an evangelism course. I thought, yeah, you know, I should, I should learn about this. And in the first class... When the instructor said, here's the syllabus, and one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be going out uh, at some point into the city, and we're just going to do some cold call evangelism. Wow, that was the last class I went to. Because <laughs> back then, it just scared the bejeebers out of me. Like, I was pretty introverted, and I mean, I, that, that's still kind of my default, but... but I did, there's no way I, it was, I wasn't going to do that. So I found something else to study. And I think that's probably, I'm being honest, that's probably where a lot of us would be if uh, somebody gave us that offer. Because I do remember at a church that I served, I went out and I bought 500 packs of light bulbs. And, uh, and I put out the announcement. I said, all, all I want to do, we put a little card on it that says, uh, light up your life. This is a gift from, uh, from our church and we just want to bless you. And so I sat up the day and said, uh, for those who would like to, to help, just stay, stay after the service. And uh, boy, I got the shock of my life. Not one person. So boy, did I ever rip into that. No, I didn't. I... <laughs> but it just told me that. It told me, wow, that strikes fear in people. Or it, it, uh, it competes with our calendars, uh, or at least we let it compete with our calendars to say, no, you know, wow, wow, I got something going on this afternoon. Jonah was essentially called by God to go to Nineveh to share his faith. Because part and parcel of the message that he was given to Nineveh, which was a word of warning, of dire warning came with his whole belief system, right? It came with his whole understanding of who God is and what God does. That God loves people, cares about them, eternally. He's got, he's got love like no other. God saves the ones who humble themselves. He exalts even, the Word of God says. He will lift up the ones who are humble. But those who are proud, those who are arrogant, those who are in league against God, uh, he will do the very opposite. He will bring discipline. And then if that discipline is not heeded, then the decision has been made by people that they want nothing to do with God. Or if at any point along the way, it is heeded and God's call is heeded. Praise the Lord! We were sitting and I sat with a group last night and we were talking about Experiences that, that, that we've had sharing faith. And in three examples, three different people said, at somebody's deathbed, you know, I, I talked to them and I shared the faith, or I shared faith again with them, and they responded positively. Uh, I, do not, I do not recommend we wait that long, amen? Because ultimately God knows the heart. And he knows the sincerity of our prayers. And he knows the sincerity of what we say to him. 
And the ones who humble themselves recognize their need, recognize our brokenness, recognize our moral failings, recognize our shortcomings spiritually, our sin, and our need for forgiveness. And then repent. And that was the message that Jonah was to take to Nineveh. Repent. Uh, you're full of moral failings. You're full of brokenness. You're just you're full of injustice. You're full of conflict. You're full of war. You're full of sin. And Jonah, along the way, he could he could have, and maybe he did, because a story like this, you only get part of the story. And Jonah, no doubt, said a whole lot more things uh, to people. He probably had dialogue with them. And he could share his personal story with them as well to say, you know, I know from personal experience that if you disobey God, you just might get swallowed up. <laughs> and so come with me to Jonah chapter 3. It's where we, we pick up the narrative. And I'm going to begin by reading the first two verses of Jonah chapter 3. And we will have those uh, so you can walk, watch along on the screen. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the sage. Oh, it is there. Sorry, the message I give you. Sorry. And proclaim to them the message that I give you. In his grace, God gives second chances. Amen? And third chances. And God gives many chances. We know that from Jesus saying to Peter, in answer to the question, how many times should I forgive my brother? Jesus said, in a way to demonstrate you just don't stop. He said, not seven times, 70 times seven. But it is advisable to learn and obey sooner than later. Not out of fear, not out of fear, but rather because when we come into relationship with Jesus, it is the sweetest, most beautiful relationship that we could ever, ever have. And to know that we have always the companion of the Holy Spirit within us, who wants to do more than just indwell us, He wants to fill us, amen? And He wants to keep filling us. It's advisable to learn sooner or later whether it's with an earthly parent or more, even more so with, with a heavenly parent. And we want to take God seriously. As one who blesses and one who disciplines and one who releases if we're insistent that all we want to do is oppose God. He will release. Wasn't it good to hear from, from Pastor James last week? Man, you know, we got, we got the most hits, the most views on our YouTube than ever. Um, no, I'm okay with that. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> I am, I'm totally okay with that. I just, people wanted to check out the new guy. Um, and I don't, hey, if, keep doing that. Bless the Lord. That was just, it was wonderful. And how he shared that he too had gone the opposite direction from where he should have gone. And he was able to go a lot farther than Jonah. Because Jonah didn't have air travel back then. Pastor James went all the way to South Korea. But earthly distance means nothing to its omnipresent creator. Amen? As David so beautifully described in Psalm 139. There's nowhere that we can hide or flee from the presence of God. Whether it's on this earth or it's out in space, there's nowhere where we can hide from Him. Surveillance systems, for me, just illustrate the everywhere presence of God. The omnipresence. The vast heavens illustrate the great creative power of God, the omnipotence of God. And the inner internet illustrates, for me, the all-knowing of God, the omniscience of God. For me, these are just glimpses, imperfect glimpses of the power 
and the ability of God. Anything that we are able to come up with, if it's good, reflects just how great and amazing God is. So let me ask us this. Are you willing to go somewhere unexpected if the Holy Spirit impresses it on you? Are you willing to go anywhere that God might call you if the Holy Spirit impresses it on you? A number of years ago, I was serving with, with a pastor, and, and the pastor's partner, pastor's wife, I came to learn that she felt, as a student, she felt a call to global missions. They married, and uh, he didn't feel any such call. And this was later on in their lives, and she actually expressed, you know, a little bit of disappointment. She said, you know, I kind of thought that God had called me, but, but it never happened. And you wonder about that. I just wondered about that. I wondered, you know, is, was that just, you know, was that second best? I, not for me to say. It's maybe not even for me to muse. But are you and I willing to go somewhere unexpected if we really sense or we really know that the Holy Spirit is impressing it on us? Now, some of you might say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, because I'm pretty confident at my age that I'm not going to get called anywhere. I'm good, I'm safe. You know, some of us might say that. But anywhere. And anywhere might mean across the hall in the building you live in, right? Anywhere might mean across the street from your house. Anywhere might mean across town where you're living. And anywhere might mean across the province or across the country or across the globe somewhere where... God may put that on your heart. The Church of Jesus Christ needs good leaders. The Church of Jesus Christ needs good servants. Wherever, however, whenever. Are we willing, if we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to our spirits, are we willing to go even somewhere unexpected? Are you open to that? Am I open to that? What is God saying to you that you need to be saying yes to? Same question we asked two weeks ago. It's a living question, isn't it? Are you willing to say yes to what God is saying to you? Are you willing to say yes? I want to suggest, too, that when we, whenever you see the word in Scripture, anywhere in Scripture, whenever you see the word preach, I encourage you to think of the word proclaim. And the reason is because, so they're synonymous, but the reason is because there are some words that when we read them, what we do is we impose on Scripture or we impose on what we're reading, our understanding right now of what that word means. And we misunderstand how it can be applied more broadly than what we think. Because if we see the word, now you go preach the gospel, you go, oh, whoo, oh, thank goodness for that. Oh, I'm not a preacher. Well, I'm not, I'm not much of a preacher either. I'm, I'm a lot more of a teacher. But we can all be proclaimers. Would you agree? And I, I believe there's some words like that that either they have done a disservice to us in how they've been translated or we have done a disservice to them by minimizing the application of them and misunderstanding the breadth that was meant. This morning, I, I want to include a few minutes to highlight the places where God has called some of the people that we as a church support. And what we're going to do a uh, great little exercise, is we're actually going to go to our website. Our website is super, super easy. It's wilmotcenter.church. How do you like that? For Wilmot Center Church. It's wilmotcenter.church. So you go to wilmotcenter.church and you click, uh, you go down, 
Thank you. To ministries. Oh, yeah. Go to ministries. Click on ministries. And then go on down to global missions. Where, of course, you want to learn more. And missionary families. And I just, I just briefly, what I want to do is I, we're, going to walk, we're going to walk down this page together just to see this. Um, we, we, we support a, a lot of missionary units or missionary families. Like, like, or, or missionary organizations, actually, like over 20. And, and here are some of the people that we have the blessing and the privilege, a number of them who have roots here at Wilmot Center Church. So the Jensen's, uh, if you really want to get called by God, they're in Kona, Hawaii. <laughs> and that's it. they're with YWAM there, right? And then the Snyders were in Chico, California. And they come back next Sunday, next Sunday evening, and we're going to continue on with uh, with with more of how to share our faith, how to share our faith with with our cousins, with those of the of the Muslim faith, how to share with them. Uh, Mike is doing that, and they're going to be heading to a sensitive area uh, later this year. That's the plan. And then the Michaels, who are related to the Jensens, are also in Kona, Hawaii. And, and, and serving with YWAM. And then the rectors. And they are in, I'm not sure how to say this, Yichlava or something like that, Czech Republic. And uh, Carol Weicker, where are you, Carol? Carol's going back there again this year to, uh, to serve and to, uh, to, work, to spend some time with students and, and share her, her music ministry. Uh, and then after the rectors are the herbs. In a place called Baden. <laughs> you know what? You know what Baden means? It means it means to bathe. So let's just bathe in the spirit, amen. All right. So Jason is with uh, Youth Unlimited there, and then the Jangras are in Montreal, Quebec, and uh, just have some some beautiful discipling and and counseling ministry in Quebec. And then the Bensons uh, serve administratively and, and, and training, training people who are either coming back or going into missions and, and, and uh, doing that training of people who are going to be released to missions. And then after the Bensons are the Diltzes, and the Diltzes serve with indigenous people uh, north of us at Golden Lake, uh, up by, by Camp Mishawa. And the Svobodas are in uh, San Francisco, California. Are they with YWAM? They, thank you. Oh, pardon me. One, wonderful. And then the Esau's uh, do a little bit of work. Barry does a little bit of work uh, for, for, Esau, for Esau's, for the YWAM, uh, technically in Chilliwack, British Columbia. All right, and who's next? Yeah, the Ellis's. Um, and there are people probably that, there's some of these folks that I haven't yet met, but uh, we've corresponded by email, and the, the Ellis's are serving also related to YWAM, I believe, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And then there are a few other missionaries that, uh, who are in sensitive areas, and so we don't name them, we don't name their place, because they need to be very careful where they are, that they, they, they try to stay under the radar, right? Next week, what I want to do is I want to show you the organizations that we also serve uh, as a church. Just again, again, fairly quickly so that you can see that because we don't always see them and when they come, they get a, a little bit of air time and, uh, and we want to continue to be encouraging them, amen? Because they are among many who have responded to the call, the Holy Spirit, to go to some place where he would have them serve. And the beauty is, he calls all of us. He calls all of us to proclaim. He calls all of us to be ministers, which is simply a word that means servants. Now for Jonah, it was to Nineveh that he was called, and after probably several showers and maybe a bath in tomato juice, after being in that fish to try to get rid of that smell, he knew it was more than just advisable to obey God's call. And so Jonah 3 Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. 
Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. And we would say, thank you, Jonah, finally you got it. But we would say, yeah, but I'm a lot like that too. God's needed to remind me a couple times and maybe give me a little kick or give me a little knock on the head because it took me a little while just to actually obey. This point, At this point in the narrative, we don't know why Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. It hasn't been, been, been expressed clearly yet. But he doesn't want to go. Maybe sharing his faith scared him. Maybe giving a prophetic word scared him. Maybe, maybe his in-laws lived in Nineveh. I, I don't know what, what the problem was. but All we know so far is that it was not his first choice to go to Nineveh. And I'm sure he loved his in-laws. Well, he might not even have been married. What we also don't know is if he went now because he really believed passionately this is the right thing to do. God has called me in. I was wrong. I really need to do this. I'm looking forward to it. Or if he went out of duty, kind of kicking and screaming. We, we don't know that quite yet. Nineveh was about 800 kilometers or a month's journey from Israel. So maybe it was the distance he didn't like. To God, I don't want to go that far. And then we carry on in the narrative and we read, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. So he went to Nineveh. We're told it takes about three days to, to kind of get through the whole city and and get a good feel for things. And so one day through, he began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 is just, it's a powerful number that God uses many times. Uh, as a period of time for people to be sifted, as a period of time uh, for people to be refined. Jesus did that. Uh, just at the beginning of his, before his ministry, 40 days. And a number of other examples of that. He began by going, and he proclaimed, 40 more days, Nineveh will be overthrown. My, my expectation is that people would have heard that from him, and they would have thought he was a crackpot, right? Of course, we're great. Life is good. You know, we're wealthy. We're a great city. We're a big city. Nineveh is booming right now. The economy's good. Uh, we're in charge. We beat up other people if, if they get in our way. We're doing great. But he proclaims this message. And he probably had more details to give, and he probably had conversations with people as he went through the city. And whatever all he said was, it had a powerful effect. Because the Holy Spirit knew that these people were ready. You know how Jesus said, the field is white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. There's a big harvest there. People are ready. And if you listen, then I'll take you to them. But the workers are few. I believe God knew there was a hunger in the people of Nineveh for something more. And so he sent Jonah because now, rather than being overturned, Nineveh, with their response, believed. And they turned around. Jonah goes to them and he says, you will be overthrown or you will be overturned. But rather than that happening, they turn around and they say, wow, this is serious business. And there was a profound revival that took place in the city of Nineveh. Isn't that awesome? There was a revival. That, and this is where revival starts. Revival starts with a good self-evaluation spiritually. We say, Lord, renew a right spirit within me. Thank you, Lord, for renewing your right spirit in me. Now, what will you do with me? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And so we go on and we read. The Ninevites believed God, and a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. 
When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes. He covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. Wow. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, said the king. Maybe God will yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that they will not perish. Wow. What a response. So the king and all the people, they, they did what people did back then. When, when, they, when they were humbling themselves, they literally would they'd remove their clothes, and especially if they were well-dressed, and they would put on sackcloth, pretty humbling stuff. Sackcloth being coarse, thick hair uh, made from goat hair. And they would put this on them, and it was a recognition that I am nothing. I'm humble. I'm humbling myself. So they put this, this cloth from goat hair on themselves. And they would express grief and humility and penitence. They would repent. And they would put aside their earthly pleasures for a while. And the call, the call, which was rather unusual, was even to put sackcloth and then ashes as well. To even put them on the animals. Just to say everything, everything needs to recognize that we need to bow before this God. Because they were obviously afraid. Maybe they had heard about what happened in that sea where Jonah had been. Maybe they smelled it and they asked him. They said, whoa, man, do you work in a fish market? And it also included fasting. And just let me briefly say and encourage us that if you're ever stuck... You're at a juncture in, in, in your life and you say, I just don't know what the right answer is. In our fast-paced society, in our microwave society, we will say, you know, I, I threw up a prayer to God and I said, God, help me, and I didn't get an answer. So, and God continues to wait. You know, God continues to wait, not in order to be coy with us, but in order for us to truly learn what dependence looks like with God. And when we set aside, it might be food, for us today, it may well be electronics, we set aside some of those things, some of those comforts, some of those pleasures, some of those luxuries, and we replace the time that we would normally spend with them in front of the screen or eating or whatever it might be, we replace that time with time before God. That's what fasting is. Uh, fasting is, is a lost practice in the West. And let me encourage you, and as a church together too, that if we come up against times and we, we, just, we need to pray into something, we're not sure what to do, this is an important thing for us to do. To lay aside some things and say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry for being impatient with you. And thinking that you should answer me when I want you to answer me. And we can humble ourselves before him. Humble ourselves before him. The people of Nineveh said, call urgently or earnestly to God. And put away, said the king, put away evil behavior. Wouldn't it be great if that happened in North America? And, and I'm not putting this on anybody. I'm not putting this on politicians. Uh, but we have a society. We are in a society that is a lot like Nineveh. I would say considerably less injustice in this country than there was in Nineveh. But that isn't to say we're without injustice. And a whole lot of behavior that is available to us that breaks the heart of God Wow, what a revival would break out if we, were, if we were saying, we revoke those things. 
We repent from those things. We will have nothing to do with those things. And whenever those things are tempting us to come toward them, we will fall back on our faces and say, Lord, I can't do this in my own strength. I need yours. We will call upon our brothers and sisters and say, help me with this. We need to walk through this together because I can't do it alone. Because when we resist the devil, he will flee. Believe it. Believe it. May we live it. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. That was always on God's mind. God knew what was going to happen. I believe that at least. And God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that Nineveh, wow, the whole city, repent. Now when you and I consider sharing God's love with people, when we get the chance to share in words and share in deeds, God's desire for them, are we surprised to find, I think sometimes we are, are we surprised to find that there are a whole lot more people than we thought who are actually receptive to the word, receptive to the invitation, receptive to the opportunity to at least begin some conversation, maybe more. I've learned that inviting people, you get a whole lot whole lot fewer refusals than what we might have thought. I mean, we know those people who will say no. But there are many who will say yes. And rather than our trying to pick them randomly, all the better that we pray and ask the Lord of the harvest, where would you send me? Where would you send us? People want something real. Let me invite the musicians forward. People don't want... This is a struggle for a lot of us. People don't want religion. They don't want ceremonies. They don't want institutions. A lot of them don't want the traditional established church. And it almost becomes an excuse or a smokescreen for people to say, yeah, you know, I'm spiritual. And people are. Praise the Lord. That's an entry point. I'm spiritual, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not much for church. Well, what a great opportunity to say, all right, if you're not much for church, what are you much for? Great opportunities to ask people questions. You know, what are you much for? What, what do you know about Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? What was your experience in church if you had one that brought you to this place? Man, what, people will pour out their answers. They will pour out their hearts. Because so often, people are looking for something that's rooted. They're looking for a cause. People are looking for something that's real. Not something that's just same old, same old, same old. Would you agree with me? I believe that. And as we engage with our neighbors, as we engage with our families, as we engage around the world, and remember, when we say for Wilmot, that's not meant to exclude anybody who doesn't live in Wilmot Township. Amen? Because for you, it might be for whatever municipality you're in. In fact, I live about five kilometers outside of Wilmot Township. Uh, but I still believe in Fort Wilmot. And I, I want to take that spirit of that, and I want to take the practice of that into where I live. Or wherever you live, wherever it may be. So that as we engage with people, and stop and meet them and get to learn what they're all about, who knows how the Lord will establish his kingdom in those people? Who knows how the Lord will establish his church that might look different from what we're used to, to complement what we're doing? Or it might look like a smaller version of this that God would birth somewhere else. Who knows? I don't want to be territorial, amen? I don't want it to be such a big thing to me where people go except that they follow Jesus. And do not give up the habit of meeting together on a regular basis. And we can encourage that as a church. Is there anything that God is saying to you that you need to say yes to? 
Let it be small. You go, yeah, yeah, it's simple. Yeah, it comes back to me right now. That Holy Spirit, that way, it might be something big. It might be something that, that, that's really been resonating in your spirit. You know, man, I don't know if this is from God or not. What a great opportunity to fast and pray. So, Lord Jesus, we come in your name. Recognizing that this whole encounter of Jonah is a foreshadowing of you. That three days in the belly of that big fish was a foreshadowing. It was a sign of your three days in the grave, in the tomb. In the, in the spiritual realm in those three days, so you're doing some pretty serious business then. And then conquering death as that, as that fish vomited Jonah out of its mouth. Lord Jesus, you are oats. And you are alive and willing and we stand here in the power of Christ we stand. And Lord, I pray you would reveal whatever it is that you would say to us as as individuals, as families, as church. This is what you're saying and you want us to say yes to it. Thank you, Lord, that that was the case with, with Pastor James. Thank you, Lord, that that was the case with all of our staff. Thank you, Lord, that that was the case of every person in this room who's a follower of you. Oh, Lord, I pray that if there be anybody in this place right now and the answer to that question is I need to say yes to Jesus, then now would be the time. Lord, if we need to say yes to Jesus and yes to the Holy Spirit about something else, may today be the time.